For the last 1,500 years, Catholic theology has been shaped by the enduring influence of two intellectual giants, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, a third figure has appeared to present the faith of the Church in the language of our own age. Explore the dynamics of the teaching of Pope John Paul II on the program Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan. Hello, my name is Father Richard Hogan. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, and I've been assigned by our Archbishop there to work full-time with Priests for Life, a national pro-life organization devoting itself to the promotion of the gospel of life, particularly regarding abortion and euthanasia. But I'm here at EWTN Studios in Alabama on this beautiful February day, February 2000. I know some of you may be listening a year or two or three down the road, but it's a gorgeous day here, and I'm happy to be in Alabama rather than Minnesota this time of year. I'm here to share with you reflections on our on our Catholic faith by Pope John Paul II. This is the fifth program in the Faith for Today series, and we're presenting the Catholic faith from the point of view of John Paul, his new theology or new synthesis of the faith using a modern philosophical movement or school called phenomenology, united with the kernels of the faith, revelation, which is what Christ came to teach us about God and ourselves, yields a new language, a new way of speaking, uh, a better way for many people living in our culture. There's nothing wrong. In fact, the other two great syntheses of the faith, that of St. Augustine using Platonic philosophy and Thomas Aquinas using Aristotelian philosophy, there's absolutely nothing wrong with those. But in the case of St. Thomas, it's 800 years old. In the case of St. Augustine, it's 1,600. Times have changed. There are new words, new ways of speaking. And what Pope John Paul II is attempting to do is to make the faith understandable in a new language using phenomenology. Now, in the last program, we ended talking about the processions in the Holy Trinity. There are really four questions about the Trinity that we should ask. The first one, of course, is if there's only one God, how do we get three persons? Secondly, if we have three persons, what is the distinction between them, especially if there is only one God? Question number three, what do they do? What is, what is the activity of God within the Trinity? And finally, number four, what is their relationship with us, in particular with regards to the activity of God towards us? And we began last time talking about the processions. And we mentioned that John Paul II's insight that created like God, it is image and likeness, that it's possible to look to human experience to know something about God is useful here. We referred to the fact that a child, a baby, usually, almost always, discovers himself or herself before discovering even other people, even the mother. Parents constantly point out how interesting it is that a child will discover his fingers or his toes. And the indication of this is that the child plays or with the toes or the fingers or the ears or the eyes, the new thing that the child discovered. But it's usually the, the very first thing the child discovers is himself or herself, her own body or his own body. This points to God because the first one God knows is himself. First of all, we, knows, we know he has a mind because he created us, and we have a mind and a will. Therefore, he has a mind. We also know that he can experience himself doing something, just as we can watch ourselves do something. So he has a self-awareness, a consciousness. So God, first of all, in his mind, knows himself. But in that act of knowing, he also sees himself knowing himself, is his consciousness or awareness. This consciousness or an awareness of his act of knowing is absolutely perfect, identical to himself. And in order for it to be perfect and identical to himself, it has to exist. So his knowing himself, knowing that he exists, has his, his reflection of this, that is to say this mirror image of this act of knowing that is in his consciousness, has to exist as well. And that is the self-knowledge of the Father, or, as we say, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, who was begotten, not made. Now, we call the second person of the Blessed Trinity, according to the revelation of the Scriptures, particularly the prologue to St. John's Gospel, we call him the Word. 
the famous prologue in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, why does John call the second person of the Blessed Trinity the Word, or in Greek, the Logos? Clearly, part of the reason is that he's using a language that was common coin in the Greek thought of the first century, the A.D. But nevertheless, there's another very theological reason why the Holy Spirit inspired him to use this. And that is because, remember, this self-knowledge is the same as a thought or an idea. When I try to teach this to an audience, to, a, to an inquiry class, I say to the people, try to think of an idea without naming it, without putting a name to it. Try to think of car without thinking about the word car, or th try to think about a house without thinking about the word house. It's almost impossible. As one person pointed out, the only way to do it is to think of a picture of the thing you're thinking about. And that's possible too. But it's, it's almost impossible to have an idea without having the word for it, or at least a picture of it. And of course the word convotes, con connotes a picture. So, when we say Christ is the Word, we're saying that he is the self-knowledge of the Father, this thought, who is the Word. Just like we have names for ideas, the name of the self-knowledge of the Father is the Word. And we say that God spoke this Word, and that is the Son. Now, it, it must be crystal clear absolutely without question that the, that there's no time where the second person of blessed trinity did not exist this is not a procession in time this is not as though the father existed he thought to himself i have this knowledge of myself and then the son appeared no way christ excuse me the second person of blessed trinity existed for all time there is never a time that he didn't exist However, he proceeds from the Father, he's begotten of the Father, in a sense that he is the self-knowledge of the Father, the perfect con self-concept that the Father has in himself. And to be perfect, this self-concept has to exist because the Father exists, and that is the Son. Now, when the Father and the Son, quote, see one another, they know one another, because they are identical to one another, there is no question that there isn't a choice in the will to, to give themselves to each other. This is an act of the will. In other words, if you think of the procession of the Son as the self-knowledge of the Father, the procession of the third person is, pertains to the will. So the Father and Son love one another. In other words, they choose to give themselves to each other. This choice is a conscious choice. They, are, they, they can't help but love each other because they're identical. So they love one another. It's a choice based on the knowledge that they have of their dignity and value and goodness. They see this, this wonderful goodness that is each other. They are, are attracted to it. Remember, though, here, there's no question of time. This is not as though this is a succession of events as it is for us. Rather, this, this exists for all time without end, without beginning. So there is this self this love of each other, and of course, this is based on the knowledge of the dignity and value that each one is to the other. And so this choice of love is a self-donation, a gift. They, they both decide to give themselves to the other, and this gift is permanent and, in a sense, life-giving because it affirms the dignity and value of each other. But just as with the self-knowledge of the Father, the Father and Son both have a have a an awareness that they are making this choice, and this awareness is absolutely perfect. In other words, it's identical to the love. And since the love exists, this perfect awareness of the love also exists, and that existence is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the love of Father and Son. So as we say in the Creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, from this mutual choice that each person makes to love each other. And the awareness that they have of their love for each other is identical to that love and therefore exists, and it is the Holy Spirit. So in a certain sense, the procession of the Son is an act of self-knowledge or of the intellect. The profession, 
the procession of the Holy Spirit is the act of love or of the will. And these persons exist. Now, although we speak in human terms here, there's no other way to talk about it. There is absolutely no question that all three persons of the Blessed Trinity existed for all time. It's not as though, to repeat, that the Father existed, then he knows himself, he knows himself for a while, and then he has an awareness of this knowledge of himself, and this awareness then suddenly pops into existence. No, that's contrary to, to everything revealed about the Trinity. There was never a time when the Son and Holy Spirit did not exist. So the processions yield at least some kind of possible way of understanding the three persons in the Trinity. But the second question that we began this show with and we ended the last one with is if, if there is only one divine nature and they're all united that one divine nature, which they are, then what is the distinction between the persons? How are they distinct from each other? One might say or suggest that there, there is, they're different the way human beings are different. Human beings, of course, all share the same humanity, the same human nature. And yet we, we are all different. So one might say, well, it's the same as that. The problem is that that is impossible because the divine nature is one and simple, as we talked about in previous shows. Therefore, there can't be individual examples of the divine nature as there are in, the, in human nature. In other words, there are not three individualized, separate, concrete repetitions of the divine nature in each divine person. As there are an incalculable number of individualized, separate, concrete repetitions of human nature in each person, that's because the divine nature is perfectly simple and one. So we can't we can't talk that way. It's not as though uh, the three persons in the divinity share the divine nature the way three human beings share the human nature. So what what are the differences? How is it possible if there's just one nature to distinguish the three divine persons? And the answer, again, is very complex in the sense that it involves a mystery which we will never completely understand, not even in heaven. But the answer pertains to the relationships. Now, again, human, human relationships can help here, at least to point the way, in a certain sense, in a negative way. We have relationships. Remember, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Trinity. Well, we have fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, grandmothers and granddaughters, uncles and nephews, and so forth and so on. We are familiar with these. But let's say I have an uncle, and that uncle dies. In a certain sense, in a certain sense, the relationship ends because the uncle is no longer around. Now, obviously, God willing, my uncle goes to heaven, and the relationship in a spiritual sense in a, continues and will be renewed at the end of the world, and so forth and so on. But abstracting from that truth for a minute, in a certain sense, when the uncle dies, the relationship ends. But I don't cease to exist because I am not defined by my nephewness, if you will. It's a strange way to say it, but I am not who I am because I'm a nephew. And he, if I were to die and he were to continue here on earth, he's not defined by the fact that he is an uncle. His whole existence doesn't depend upon the fact that he's an uncle. The, the relationship, in other words, is not essential to who each of us is. And that's the way, it's true, the way it is in all human relationships. We are not who we are because of the relationship that we might have with another human person. But in God, in God, the relationship makes the person be who he is. Now, again, one has to be very careful here. Because one cannot, cannot say that there ever was a time when God did not exist or that the relationship did not exist. But in order to understand the difference in the Trinity among the three persons, we say that in the first person, fatherhood, whatever it means to be father, constitutes or defines the person. The person is fatherhood, standing there, existing. It's as though your father were defined in his very essence by being a father. 
In fact, he couldn't have existed then before he was a father. Now, this obviously doesn't pertain to human relationships. But in the Trinity, fatherhood stands there and exists and is the first person of the Trinity. The only difference between the first and the second person, or the first and third for that matter, is the fact that the first person is fatherhood. In everything else, they are identical. The second person is sonship. Whatever it means to be son makes him be who he is. And the third person is love. This is called subsisting relationships. And as I mentioned at the end of the um, end of the first program, or excuse me, the previous program, uh, St. Augustine wrote 400 pages on this whole thing and on the, on the mystery of the Trinity and said in his last paragraph or two, it's really better not to think about these things. And there's something to that. There's something to just accepting the Trinity as a matter of faith and making the sign of, sign of the cross and ending our prayers with an affirmation of the Trinity without worrying about all of these details. Nevertheless, nevertheless, it's useful from time to time to reflect on this because it yields an understanding, at least to a certain extent, never complete, of the awesomeness and the wonderfulness of God. And that can be very useful in terms of devotion and in our pilgrimage and journey to holiness. As one of the saints, I think, mentioned, after all, we're going to spend eternity in heaven with God. It behooves us to come to know him, at least to a certain extent and as far as we can. So the distinction in the Trinity is based on the relationships. The first person is fatherhood, second person is sonship, and the third is love. And the relationship, loveness, fatherhood, sonship, makes that person be who he is. The father is distinct from the son precisely because he is fatherhood and not sonship. The son is distinct from the father because he is sonship and not fatherhood. And the third person is distinct because he is love and not fatherhood, or sonship. And that may sound like double talk, but if you think about it, read a little bit about it, it does gradually sink in and make some sense. The best way to think about it, of course, is to remember human relationships that do not make us be who we are, but in the Trinity, they do define us. And that's how you can have the one God in the nature, but in the persons, there's a distinction because of the names we give them. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is a point which we should at least refer to. When we talk about the nature of God, and that would have been all of those shows on the characteristics, the divine characteristics, the fact that he's the end cause, cause, changeless, timeless, and so forth, we are talking about the nature. And the question there that would yield those answers is, what is God? That is to say, What refers to the nature? If I say, for example, what is that animal over there? It's a horse. You would say it's a horse, which would mean that it has four legs and stands tall and can be ridden and is fairly fast and so forth and so on. That refers to the nature. If I said, who is that horse? That would be a nonsensical question because who refers to the person? If I said, what are you? You would say human being. If I said, who are you? You'd give me your name. So, with God, the question what refers to his nature, his attributes, his characteristics. The question who refers to the Trinity. And there's a oneness in the whatness of God, a oneness in the nature. And there is a distinction among the persons of the who of God. So, and the distinction is, of course, based on these relationships. And we name them by the relationships. Father, who is fatherhood. Son, who is sonship and Holy Spirit, who is love, existing. Now, the Trinity, of course, is perfectly and totally united in nature, and there's this distinction in persons. But the next question has already actually been answered, and that is, what, is, what does God do all day? What, what activity is there among the three persons? Do they stand around and watch TV, or what? Well, obviously, TV didn't exist when at the dawn of time and in fact God existed for all time even before TV so what does he do well obviously they love each other the the three persons of the trinity are a firehouse fireball of love it is a infinite uh, conflagration the greatest fire you could ever think of of love and this of course is that each person gives himself to the others because of 
the knowledge of the dignity and value that that person sees in the other two. So it's love is a choice based in the will, founded on knowledge, knowledge of the dignity and value of the other two persons. And this choice is a self-donation, and it is permanent and life-giving in the sense that it affirms the dignity and value of the other two persons. So in this loving communion, the Trinity has, of course, a mirror in human society. And that mirror is the family and, as we will see in a later show, also the union of of those engaged in work. They're supposed to mirror the Trinity. But we call this union of persons, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a communion of persons, or I should say that's what John Paul II calls it. In other words, love, the love that each person has for the other two, which is based on this knowledge of the dignity and value of the other two, and this choice is to give oneself to the other two, and this is a permanent and life-giving union, this yields a communion of persons. Now, obviously, they're united in the nature. Clearly, there's only one God. But when you're talking about from from the point of view of the persons, granted, there's a union in the nature, but for, from the point of view of the communion of persons of the Trinity, this is a union in persons. This is a union by an act of the will of God, each person giving himself to the other two because of the knowledge of the dignity and value of the other two, and this union is permanent and life-giving. So not only are they united in the nature, but each person unites himself with the other two, and this is a perfect union. In a way, it's, it's rather redundant to talk about the union of persons through the will because there's a union in the nature. However, we have to think of God as this, as this enormously simple but yet very, very profound mystery. Simple but yet mysterious. And in order for us to understand anything about it, we have to look at God from different points of view. He doesn't do that, but we need to. And so we looked at him from the nature, from the whatness of God. We looked at him from the who of God, talking about the processions and the distinction of the relationships. And this unity of persons is important because it looks at the unity of God from the point of view of the trinity of the person rather than from the point of view of the nature. Now, in terms of what God does towards us, this is also rather important. And it's a principle that um, is been long attended to by the church, and that is that God, in acting towards us, act as one. In other words, outside of the Trinity, the, the acts of God are the acts of all three persons. Now, we attribute creation to the Father, revelation and redemption to the Son, and sanctification to the Holy Spirit. But in each of these, the other two persons are present. For example, in the act of creation, clearly it's act of power, which is attributed to the Father. And yet, in, in creating the world, obviously God revealed something about himself. In other words, he revealed knowledge or wisdom, and that's the Son. Because when you look at any human being, you see a reflection of God. You know something about God, just like you know something about the painter when you look at his painting. So in creating, God revealed. He revealed his wisdom, which is the attribute of the Son or the primary characteristic of the Son. And obviously this was an act of love, as we've mentioned before, because in, in sharing existence, God shared himself being. And so it was a choice to give himself. So love is also present in the act of creation. The incarnation and the redemption are the same thing. Clearly, it's revelation. I mean, the Son reveals the Father. As um, he said to Philip, the apostle, when Philip asked him, show us the Father and that'll be enough for us, Jesus turned to him and said, don't you understand, I'm paraphrasing, don't you understand that when you see me, you see the Father. So Christ revealed the Father and the Holy Spirit. So this was an, the incarnation redemption was an act of revelation or act of wisdom, act of revealing knowledge, which is, of course, appropriate to the Son because he's the self-knowledge of the Father. Even the cross is an act of revelation in the sense that it reveals God's incredible love for each of us. So it's, it's the self-knowledge of the Father revealed. But nevertheless, it's an act of power. The union of the two natures in Christ, for example, is an incredible act of the power of God. It's also present in the miracles of Christ, and especially, and especially in the resurrection. 
uh, because in this this act, the power of God over death is obviously revealed, and most especially uh, because this is probably the most important aspect from our point of view. The uh, incarnation redemption reveals love too, or shows us love, and in that sense, the Holy Spirit is acting here too. Christ. God the Son emptied himself, be, taking the form of a slave, to quote St. Paul, in order for us to know something about the Father. That's clearly an act of the love of the Father, and the redemption of the cross was the most stupendous act of love that you can possibly imagine. So just as with the creation, where power, the Father, wisdom, the Son, love, the Holy Spirit, is present, although it's attributed to the Father because the chief aspect is power, the redemption and incarnation, while primarily an act of revelation, an act of wisdom, that is to say, revealing the self-knowledge of the, of, of the Father, which is the activity of the Son, clearly that the incarnation redemption shows power and it shows love. The Holy Spirit, sanctification, power is present because can you imagine sustaining the number of relationships that God does? This is incredible. Every single human being. How many can most of us sustain? Five, six? But he has the whole world. That's power. And clearly, when when the Holy Spirit works through grace, we all put on Christ. We put on wisdom. There's the self-knowledge. And obviously, it's an act of love because sanctification means we unite ourselves with God himself. So the primary activity of sanctification is love, which is the Holy Spirit. However, power and wisdom are also present. So when God acts towards us, all three act, even though we attribute creation because of power to the Father, redemption and incarnation to the Son because of self-revelation of wisdom, and uh, sanctification to the Holy Spirit because of love. All three are present in all three. I'm Father Richard Hogan, and this is uh, the continuation of the Faith for Today series on EWTN. Please listen again for the next show when we will take up the question of the angels. Thank you. Bye. Join us again next time for Faith for Today with Father Richard Hogan here on EWTN Global Catholic Radio.